here comes the pause. Hey, hello. I'm Joan Rettman, Area Community Relations Director here at the Gardens at Town Square. And thank you for attending today's presentation, How Emerging, Emerging Technologies Will Enhance Independent Living. Before we begin, I'd love to share a few words with you about the Gardens at Town Square, which is one of eight premier retirement communities owned and operated by Era Living, which has been managing uh, communities for the past 34 years. The Garden of the Town Square is a lovely retirement community consisting of independent living with the ability to add assisted living services in the same apartment. The Gardens is just the perfect size community with 142 apartments, plus 26 private apartments within the terrace at the Gardens, which is our special memory care neighborhood. We are conveniently located near downtown Bellevue and just steps away from local favorites, like the French Bakery, my personal favorite, Cielo's Mexican Restaurant, the Braeburn Shops, and the Bellevue Public Library. We're also just minutes from the Bellevue Square and medical centers such as Overlake and Kaiser. The Gardens is known for its feeling of independence and vibrancy, our relationship with the University of Washington and lifelong learning focus, its warm hospitality and lovely amenities, including one of the brightest and most cheerful dining venues, plus a serene private garden courtyard, our little oasis in the city. You'll find a wide variety of newly renovated apartments here, including studio, one bedroom, and two bedroom options. There's a picture of our courtyard on your screen right now, in case you haven't had a chance to visit us. And now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker for today's event. We're so pleased to have Bridget Agara join us today to help us better understand something that many of us have a love-hate relationship with at times, and that is digital technology. Although learning how to use new technology can be frustrating at times, there are some tips and tricks that make it a lot easier and can also be very fun. So Bridget, who provides training and service of all things digital for seniors through her local company, Gentle, uh, gentletechhelp.com, is here to understand how smartphone tips virtual reality, and more can support us in retaining independence as we age. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn this over to Bridget. So welcome, Bridget. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hello. Let's, uh, can we make sure I am spotlighted or highlighted? People are going to want to be able to see my screen with the full um, slide once I go to full slides. So thank you all very, very much for being here. Something I know about everybody who's here is that you have a very curious mind because this is a topic that um, is something that we can really explore. This isn't quite the same as, you know, how to have a different uh, uh, ringtone on your phone. This is something about how technology may be changing everything upcoming. And our little part of the world here, the east side is a big part of that. So thank you for coming and sharing your afternoon. Uh, can everybody see me reasonably large? Can you see me reasonably large? Yes, okay. And let me just say from what I can see, because I've got a million things open on my screen, Lutz, John Barrett, and Colin Bell, you are the people I can see, so don't fall asleep or, or anything, okay? If you guys are the ones I'm looking at for my reactions for everything that we're gonna talk about today. So no pressure, but you're the only, you're the entire audience for me today. All right, so what I'll be talking about is how emerging technologies will enhance, enhance independent living. We're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening, how companies and um, universities, MIT is studying these things and what kind of things may develop in future. So we're gonna be really future-based here. Uh, I'm happy to have questions. We may have more questions at the end when I'm done, but if you, know, if you need to kind of hold me in the middle, we can do that as long as it's kind of brief. So let's see, can everybody see the big slide instead of my face? Good, Colin, well, okay, great. Let's, I saw your nod, so I'm gonna go with you. All right. The thing is, this is going to look like magic. What we're talking about is stuff that's going to feel so strange, um, but can be really practical. So I think everybody knows that um, demographically, 
we are just increasing and increasing and increasing in the elder population. I'm at the very end of the baby boomer folks. So I am at the very end of this big crest of people who are retiring, what just started like a few years ago. And um, there are a lot of folks who will be needing care, financial care, medical care, and caregiving. And what we need to do, of course, as a society is how do we help people maintain their independent lives as long as they can, like at gardens at Town Square. Um, we've just going through the pandemic. We know how challenging things can get at times. And for people to live independent lives in their own spaces um, is something that's really positive. So we have just this little chart. The share of 80 plus people um, is set to double by 2050 in the United States. That's, uh, this is our green line here. There's gonna be a lot of folks. So we need to be planning how we can do things. So I'm gonna back up a little bit and talk about this concept of accessibility. So accessibility is something as easy as when you use your phone or your computer, you might make the text a little larger right, so, to help your eyes see. So accessibility is about making technology work for your specific situation. And there can be many friction points that people have when they're using technology. A physical impairment like tremor, right, or impaired movement, diminished hearing or sight, right? These can all get in the way of us using our devices, our computers, tablets, and phones. But here's the piece that is in addition to this. So a 22 year old who has a gripping problem knows that they can find ways to get around that and use the technology, right? They have this deep knowledge about technology. From my perspective and my experience working with seniors, there's really more to the story than just these four things. So for seniors, in addition to those friction points, maybe with impaired physical or movement or hearing and sight, I found there are, there are some additional ones. One is awareness. People often say, I had no idea my phone could do that. I had no idea. So unlike the 22 year old who already who knows how to use their phone in amazing ways, right? But they just need to work around the grip thing. Somebody who's older may not have any idea that their phone can help them in such a way. Um, mastery fatigue. This is something, I'm sorry, the 22 year old doesn't understand. You have learned to use in your life, I don't know, four different coffee makers, five different microwaves, three different phones, right? You've already learned how to use Microsoft Word several versions of times in your life. So there's this fatigue of, looking at the microwave, how does this work? Do you hit the numbers first or you hit the power first, right? And the last thing is this attitude towards technology. Seniors have kind of this built-in thing that society kind of dumps on us, right? Oh, I, 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 I can't do technology. I can't do it at all, right? Seniors can be intimidated. They can be put off by the designs that are unintuitive, how many times, even on Zoom, right? There are a whole bunch of things hidden behind three dots or hidden behind three lines or there's menus hidden behind, right? It's not really intuitive as a design. And there are gender stereotypes. I rarely come across a senior woman that I work with as a client who doesn't say at least once in the beginning, I'm so dumb when it comes to technology, right? It's Nobody says, I'm so dumb because I don't know calculus. Or, I'm so dumb because I, I can't change the rings on my uh, transmission or out of the, the uh, gasket on my transmission in my car. Nobody says that, but they say it with technology all the time. So with your car, you need to be able to drive your car. With your car, you need to know once in a while, I need to take it in and get the oil changed, right? But you don't say I'm dumb because I don't know how to rebuild the engine or I don't know how to change my brake pads. So I try and get people to kind of get off. But here are some friction points with seniors and technology. The people in here, I expect, have less of a feeling like that because you're here to hear this talk today. So when we talk about friction, you know, all kinds of microwaves are different. 
I had a client who uh, moved homes and her microwave was different than the microwave that she had used in her old home. You know, sometimes some microwaves you put in the time and then quick or the time and the power or the power and something. She was so overwhelmed that she just stopped heating up food and was just eating yogurt, right? Um, I had somebody who had hearing aids and had a problem with her hearing aids and was kind of overwhelmed with that. And it was gonna be a two day wait to go into the, to the um, audiologist. So she knew that she couldn't hear if there was a fire or she couldn't hear if, you know, the fire, uh, if someone came to the door. So she just left her door unlocked. So when people are intimidated by their technology, they take do these workarounds that may not be safe or helpful. This is really also something to think about um, when you're considering where you live, right? To be living somewhere where there's safety and security around you. So we want to think about friction as a way to, how do we deal with this so that people can do their activities of daily living in a way that there's less risks and less health risks, um, and it increases the feeling and length of time they have independent in their lives. Okay. So who's doing something about this? There is some academic research. Very few of the companies that do this are looking at things for seniors, but one is MIT's Age Lab. And MIT's Age Lab, sponsored by a bank, but it's sponsored by an investment bank, which is no surprise. They have some very interesting concepts about aging and they're uh, looking at ways that technology can help aging. So they have four phases of retirement that they talk about. The honeymoon phase, which is just, well, I have all the time in the world. I'm gonna walk 10,000 steps a day. We're gonna travel. Second stage, Big decision phase. Are we keeping the house? Are we moving near family? Are we moving to a place with um, you know, less upkeep worries and more people around for safety? So those big decisions. Then navigating the longevity, which is how to keep yourself healthy and going for a long time. And then oftentimes, if people have been lucky enough to be in a couple, for much of their life, somebody is gonna spend some time alone. So MIT divides this into the four phases of retirement. And they talk about three questions. These are almost silly questions, but they're used to identify how technology friction impacts daily life. So the three questions, we'll look at them. Who will change my light bulbs? How will I get an ice cream cone? And who will I have lunch with? What do those things stand for? Who will change my light bulbs? So you can't just take for granted that you will be able to continue doing the maintenance around your home if you're living in, let's say, a house by yourself. So one needs to think about, and as a society, we think about how do we care for people with little things like maintenance and basic repairs and house cleaning? Obviously, one answer is, um, our host today, being in places where there, are, there is uh, assistance available. Also, how do people find people to trust to do those things? And there's a big cost to retirement savings if people are having to do these big tasks or having um, to have lots of people work with them to do things that maybe in the past they would have done by themselves. Another question that MIT asks when they're thinking about seniors and technology. Example, how would I get an ice cream cone? So this encompasses a lot more than it looks like, right? How do we look at transportation when and where you want? How, what are driving alternatives to things that not just the necessary things, but some fun things? And what kind of activities are in somebody's life to keep them engaged and active and have some delight in life, not just sort of being just alive in a room somewhere, a house somewhere. And the last one that they ask is, who will I have lunch with? Again, this is a question that represents a big bucket of things. Different from your parents' generations, 
um, you are more likely to be living alone in a house, have fewer children, um, more likely to live in the suburbs or rural versus a downtown with lots of people around. There are not so many active livable communities just out in the suburbs. People tend to be a little isolated in their houses. And the diminishment of a robust social network, you know, it's wonderful when you have lots of people around that you know and people who can greet you each day or somebody who notices if you're not picking up your mail or your, you know, your car isn't moving or something, you know, having that robust network of people to play cards with or go to the movies with um, is pretty helpful. And I think all of us during the pandemic felt, no matter what situation you were in, felt a, a bit of um, change with that. So this is talking about, you know, suburbia being maybe not quite so walkable, not quite having robust bus services, people don't know their neighbors. So these three questions are what MIT's Age Lab uses to kind of trigger bigger conversation. And how do you get, you know, it's Massachusetts Institute of Technology, how do you get these brilliant 20 and 21 year olds to be thinking about what it's like to live through a day as somebody who's 86? You make them 86. <laughs> you give them this thing called an empathy suit, which they developed. It has bands that constrict the arms so they can't really lift over their heads. Their shoes are unbalanced. The glasses are wobbly. Their ears are a little bit plugged. Um, things are uncomfortable. They have big gloves that they can't quite feel things. I would love to see the insurance waivers that these students have to fill out to get into this thing. But this is what you do. This is what you do to make a brilliant 21 year old um, have some sense of what it's like to get into a grocery store and how do you get the thing off of the top, right? How do you get the thing off of the bottom if your back hurts, right? Now, this doesn't make their joints hurt, but I guess this is the best you can do. So MIT Age Lab is kind of the premier place looking at aging and technology. So, in terms of technology itself, the commercial companies are the ones you would expect. This is uh, Facebook, this little symbol up at the top. It used to be Facebook, now it's called Meta. Google, Apple, and Microsoft. And of course, PNW up here, uh, Microsoft and Meta both have huge research labs in Redmond. So we have a big presence in what is being studied here. So let's look at some of the things that are available right now. Some kinds of things that are assistive features that could be on our phones. This is an iPhone, for example. In an iPhone, you can set it up in the settings, in the accessibility settings and sounds to just listen for the sound of breaking glass or sirens or a baby crying, right? Or the doorbell knocking or water running. So your phone can listen for those things and alert you if it hears those things. It's like flashing. Now, Apple makes has a big disclaimer that says, don't rely on this in life and death situations. Meaning I wouldn't trust it to hear the baby crying, right? but these are things that are available and may be um, better implemented in future. Uh, there are pieces like, um, again, on the right, this is on an iPhone. You can put in some medical information and if the emergency services in your area has the right kind of stuff on their end and you call 911 from your phone, they can suck up your medical information right from your phone call. So right from your phone call, they can get information even if you can't speak. So our phones are being able to use, be used much more like kind of like a little junior medic alert. Let's see, if, this, if I'm in the background, is this, does this bother any? I like being able to kind of point. Hopefully this doesn't bother anyone if I'm in the background a little bit. I'll see if this works. So we also see already, no, I don't want to. Um, we also see already, many of you have Alexa and Siri, right? 
Alexa is a Google uh, powered voice assistant. You might have like this woman sitting in the chair, that little disc is her way to tell Alexa to do things, turn on lights, make calls, place things on her grocery list. This uh, very high techy looking guy has um, Alexa enabled glasses, which you can buy. And instead of talking into a disc or the phone, he can talk into his glasses and say, add dragon fruit recipes to my to-do list. But you need to be within speaking distance for these. And obviously you need to have a voice. But these glasses and these discs are available now. As we talk about those things, those voice assistants, we begin to tie into the Internet of Things. This is a big phrase for the future, the IOT, Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is um, things in your home that you wouldn't expect that connect to the Internet and talk to each other. So in this little example, your computer. I mean, you know, you may have your computer and your phone hooked up together so that there are similar things there. But you can hook up your medicine, your pill case. You can hook up your refrigerator so that if you're at work, back when people went off to work, you can use the camera inside your refrigerator to see what you're low on. I'm not really thinking that that's an enormous piece currently for seniors. But what if your caregivers out of state could see, you know what? Uh, grandma hasn't really eaten anything for a long time. She hasn't really opened the fridge. Those eggs are still there. There's never any vegetables. I mean, really what everybody wants is somebody nagging them about what they're cooking and eating. But when we think about it as a way for family to, to be helping care, this is kind of an interesting thing. So internet of things is having things that you wouldn't think of as being computery, like light bulbs, like refrigerators, like pill cases, actually be connected and be able to share information. Okay. Internet of Things also currently has things like smart, these smart ovens that are both refrigerate them all, they can refrigerate them all day, and then from a telephone, from a cell phone, they could be turned on to go into cooking mode and have food be prepared and ready. So we think about this internet of things and technology. If you have a caregiver that comes in the morning to a home and sets this up, there can be hot, nutritious food at night without there being um, you know, prepping or somebody reminding them to turn it on. And these things can be handled remotely. These are incredibly expensive and not something I think that everybody is jumping to do. But this is, again, giving you an idea of where we're going with technology and independent living. Uh, many of you have seen uh, the, uh, uh, the portal, these devices like a little tablet, which is really just set up primarily for video calls. So this is that, you know, of course, during the pandemic, we needed this. So, you know, things like this. We have remote contact, which is health data sharing. Again, on an iPhone, um, you can have some of your health uh, stats, especially if you have a watch that kind of measures your AFib levels or your blood oxygen and things. You can, in your steps, you can share that with other people in your family so that they could see if you're not walking very much or if it seems like your sleep is disrupted. And I think many people have had uh, those halter tests, the halter monitor tests, right? Where you wear a halter monitor and it's kind of connected to an app and then your doctor's office reads the results, right? So these are things, some technology things that feel kind of strange and are, but are currently available. So a little more in depth, about our Pacific Northwest connections. There uh, is a nonprofit here called Acquaint. And while they aren't primarily using virtual reality headsets anymore, this one is a virtual reality headset, they connect people all over the world with an emphasis on seniors. And they connect people all over the world together to be watching um, and discussing and sharing uh, 
videos and content about their local area. So you might be connected with somebody who lives in Lagos and they're telling you, uh, you're both sharing at the same time, these videos and experiences, these 3D experiences, um, which you can even see on a phone uh, together. And you're telling them about your space where you are living, not your space, but the area in the world where you live. They tell you about theirs. It's a shared connection between people with a real emphasis on seniors and they're based in Bellevue. And these experiences, what's interesting about these tech experiences is it's not like watching a video. You're actually connecting with another human being and sharing and coming out of that with a connection in the world that you hadn't had before in perspective. So Acquaint is a little nonprofit. Um, the lovely people there. And one thing to note is the uh, beginning of augmented reality, which we'll talk about in a minute. Augmented reality meaning things that you can see in addition to the real world, like your glasses, was invented by this dude, Tom Furness, 1967, the world's first display where you could be looking out the cockpit of your plane and also be seeing information fed to one eye. And here he is, hopefully he's not on the call. Um, this is him, he's still working. He has started so many things. He's still at UW and has created so, 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 so many amazing new things in the world. Um, and he's really, he's really local. And this is another reason why our area is really a um, hotbed for this augmented reality research because we have this groundbreaking person local with so many students who, uh, graduate and then stay locally to do their exciting work. So let's go from him and augmented reality and talk about immersive technologies. So we went to the internet of things, which is just computerized things talking to each other. We looked at what companies are kind of looking at technologies, what technologies are kind of available now, what MIT is looking at. Let's talk about two big kinds of immersive technology. One is called virtual reality. So virtual reality is uses a big old clunky headset like this, and it blocks out the world, and you're just seeing what's inside the headset. It's almost like you know the big Cinerama theaters. You're not seeing the real world. You're only seeing the imaginary world. In this picture, it's like you could be underwater, a scuba diver. You're not seeing your room. On the left is an example of augmented reality. Augmented reality is you're seeing your room, you're seeing out your car windshield, you're seeing the real world, but you're also seeing these other things that aren't really there that are giving you information about the world. Um, so an example of those, again, these are, we're in the hotbed of this, Microsoft's HoloLens, this is their HoloLens. Uh, unfortunately, it's not being, uh, available for consumers anymore. It's just industry and military. But you can see this, this is kind of a, an example of somebody assembling, instead of having to look at the handbook, look up at the engine, look at the handbook, look at the engine, look at the handbook, look at the engine. They're looking through, they're seeing the engine and they're seeing examples of how you fit this thing in there. Um, jig space. 3D AR models is something you can get on your phone, just jig space, and you in your own home can stand in there and be looking through your phone and seeing coral, a coral reef that you can walk under, around, and through. This isn't just a two-dimensional picture. It's in your space, and you can walk all the way around it, look down on it, look under it. And they're educational. They have um, pieces like heart stents and how does a toaster work? And this coral reef can be in your living room and you could stand on it and watch the turtles and the fish swim around in it in absolute 3D. Augmented reality also includes on your phone, Google Translate you can go on any phone, free on any phone. This first picture, the Microsoft Manual of Style, is what it looks like in the real world out on my deck. And the one on the right is translated into Japanese. 
So you'll see the translation, okay? That's what's so exciting about that. The fact is, is that it covers up the old one. It puts a colored background to try and match the book. And it puts the new Japanese font in a way that looks as close as possible to the original book. So now not just is it adding something to the world, like it's not just adding a coral reef to your living room. It's not just adding this translation as a little cartoon balloon off to the side. It's altering what you see entirely. Okay. This is something that's current now. So think of this for a senior with limited English skills. And imagine if your glasses, instead of just holding up your phone, which you could do right now, is imagine if your glasses just automatically translated the signs around you and the things in your home into English, right with your wearable glasses, just regular old glasses, not the big old headset. Let's look at some of the other ways that augmented reality can be currently helping us get around. You'll look, this is, uh, I think this one is Apple Live View. Google has this too right now on your phone. In your phone, any of the mapping apps, you can hold it up, tell it where you're going. It shows you on the map on the bottom. And then you hold it up to the, landscape and it puts a big sign that says walk this way, walk this way. Can you imagine being somewhere in the world? You're not sure where you are, but you want to go to the bakery. And there's like these floating signs in the air that tell you which way to walk. When you come to the corner, maybe the corner isn't marked very well. You can use this to get around. This is right now. You could do this right now. But I always tell people, it comes with the caveat that if you're somewhere you don't know where you are and you're holding up your very expensive phone at the end of your arm, you know, be careful with that because it's pretty much saying, you know, maybe do it like this, but I wouldn't do this because it's basically saying, hey, take me. But you could do this right now to help you walk around places. All right. Now things get smarter and pervasive. Like they can come out of your phone and begin to be places like your eyeglasses or your car windshield. So pervasive meaning it's just part of your day-to-day -day life. And just very briefly, we're getting into artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, which is kind of the voodoo place where they're not ex even exactly sure what the how the computers are learning as, uh, as much as they do. All right, and I have this video. So this video is an actual, uh, not in not in consumer production, but it's a prototype. Not even actually, it's not even a prototype. It's it was launched. I don't think it's just for consumer sale yet. This is your windshield in your car has this little blue line that tells you where you're going. It tells you don't hit the trash can. Watch out, something fell in the road. I love this bicyclist because, as you know, up here in winter. It's pitch black outside. It can be raining and a bicyclist, even with reflectors, can be really invisible, All right? So imagine your car windshield helping you drive by saying, you know, hey, watch, watch out for this. Okay. Uh, fun little note, you know, when you go to websites and they say, click the pictures where you see a taxi or click the pictures where you see a, a street light. We're actually training the self-driving cars and stuff. I mean, they don't, they don't just pick that randomly. It's because we're doing this work of helping train the drivers, the computers who will be driving us. So at this moment, I would like to share also something that's a Microsoft experiment that you can get right now. Unfortunately, it's only for iPhones, but it's absolutely free and it's an experimental software that they have. It's called Seeing AI. And it combines this, that the, uh, the computer's knowing a lot about what we do and helping people who are blind. So I'd like to share this little video because they do it very well. And um, Joan, will you make sure Will you give me a thumbs up if you can hear the sound coming from this?
Seeing AI is a Microsoft research project for people with visual impairments. The app narrates the world around you by turning the visual world into an audible experience. Point your phone's camera, select a channel, and hear a description. The app recognizes saved friends. Jenny near top right, three feet away. Describes the people around you, including their emotions. 28-year-old female wearing glasses looking happy. It reads text out loud as it comes into view, like on an envelope. Ken Lawrence, P.O. Box. Or a room entrance. Conference 2005. Or scan and read documents like books and letters. The app will guide you and recognize the text with its formatting. Top and left edge is not visible. Hold steady. Lease agreement. This agreement. When paying with cash, the app identifies currency bills. 20 US dollars. When looking for something in your pantry or at the store, use the barcode scanner with audio cues to help you find what you want. Campbell's tomato soup. When available, hear additional product details. Heat in microwave full on height. And even hear descriptions of images in other apps like Twitter by importing them into Seeing AI. A close up of Bill Gates. Finally, explore our experimental features like scene descriptions to get a glimpse of the future. I think it's a young girl throwing a frisbee in the park. Experience the world around you with the Seeing AI app from Microsoft. Let me come back. Okay. So something that's pretty amazing about that is Literally, did you catch, it said, the woman is three feet away. She's 28 years old. If it knew her, it knew the name. Imagine the glasses, your glasses, if you looked at somebody and they said, oh, that's, that's Suzanne, right? That's maybe your helper who comes to see you. Or maybe there's five people and you have memory issues and it looks and it shows you that one is Suzanne and the other one is Jane, right? Um, it read her expression. It estimated her age. I did this with my son uh, once. I don't have that one to share, but it said like a 26-year-old young, a 26-year-old man sitting at a computer. It's like yes, it was. So here's an example I did. This is an app you can get called Seeing AI on the uh, App Store. It's an experimental thing. There's no, you can't buy anything with it. You can't do anything with it other than what it is. So I used in uh, my son's household, I took a picture and this, this is the smart computers. Probably a cat sitting on a stack of clothes was indeed a cat sitting on a stack of clothes. And probably a room with a toy car and toys was definitely that. There was no human involved, right? Those to us look very simple, but imagine your camera, imagine your old fashioned camera, right? Being able to tell you what it's looking at. Right. So it's, it's can be a little interesting, a little frightening, a little wonderful, right? As your eyesight diminishes, imagine this being able to help. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges facing those glasses, those augmented reality glasses. So Apple has patented glasses, augmented reality glasses that automatically vision correct for you. So you've got your Apple things on and you look in the distance and it knows how to change the focus. So you look up close, it knows how to change the focus. No more bifocals, no more driving glasses, reading glasses. Apple has already got this patented for a vision correction system in just wearable glasses. I just would love that. I'm a person who has three sets of glasses for different times. The challenge of that is definitely, it's a huge challenge because when our eyes look at something, they go, oh, that's far away. I wanna focus on it. I'm gonna change my muscles a little bit and focus on it in the distance. I'm gonna change my focal point. Well, what, this, this is really interesting when it comes to things that are in these glasses because our brains are part of our seeing, right? It's not just our eyes, it's our brain. So when you look at your, your television screen, your eyes know that this is a screen that's about eight feet away. And whether or not you're looking at a close-up of someone's face or a landscape in the distance, your eyes are focused on a physical screen eight feet away. It knows that that's eight feet away. You're looking at the Mona Lisa in the museum, 
it knows that's a picture on the wall. Your eyes aren't straining to focus on the background behind the Mona Lisa. Your eyes know this is a two-dimensional object stuck on a wall. Well, once you've got these things right up on your eyes, right up in your face, it fools your eyes. So what happens is if you've got these on, they're trying to figure out ways to do this so you don't get a headache, right? Because your brain goes, all these things are just like right there in the glass. It's right there. It's just right there in your face. You don't need to uh, focus far away or close up. It's right there. Um, but our brains, our eyes want to. So that can be uncomfortable if you have, if you're doing that for a while, because your eyes keep going, wait, I want to, I want to look close up, but I don't have to. It's already close up. I don't get it. So that says something they have to work around. So now let's think about for our end, before we can have our discussion, what can we imagine and what are kind of our issues? So we can imagine some ways that these pervasive technologies can be used. So you're wearing, we talked about the microwave. What happens when we have a device that we can wear on our face? It knows where we're looking. Maybe we look for five seconds at the microwave. So now our, our glasses know we're looking at the microwave. The microwave is connected to the um, to the Internet of Things, so the micro the magnify the microwave knows we're looking at it. The glasses know we're looking at it, and then we say, "How do I set this for 30 seconds?" Or please set this for 30 seconds, and it just does it. It's even a step beyond Siri, right, or Alexa. It knows what we're looking at. What happens when instead of your med meds device just sending up a chime or an alarm telling you it's time for meds? What happens when you have a little companion? If any of you saw the remake of Blade Runner, uh, he had this com companion, which was a gorgeous woman companion, but I'm just for my purposes, let's say a little monkey or a little dog. And these little critters are part of your everyday living, right? They kind of jump up. They jump onto your table, they jump onto your things and say, hey, it's time for your meds, right? Come on, let's go. And they kind of show you how to get to your meds. So they go, we're 10 minutes over, or you know, is it time for me to call your family or whatever these things are? Is it time for us to go take a walk? We need to go take a walk. If you had a little virtual dog running around your house in a way like that coral reef, if you had a little virtual dog running around saying, okay, it's time for a five minute walk outside, that is a simple, a simple, simple way that we can ensure that people are getting up and taking a walk um, without even sometimes if there is someone there to go for a walk with them. Okay. When can we expect to see these kinds of glasses and things happening? Microsoft, uh, Apple has been rumored to be having these come out within the next two years for the last five years. As far as I hear, 2023 for sure, um, but that's just, it just keeps being within the next two years for as many years as there's been. Apple is probably the first one we're gonna see for consumers. And I'd love to hear what your opinions, this is me wearing a magic leap, which is also not, uh, not in the big time anymore, but is fairly amazing and, uh, it's really hard to be able to describe to somebody, um, to be able to describe color to somebody who's never seen color or the feeling of being in a 3D movie if you've only ever seen like a 2D movie, right? You know, in a 3D movie when somebody like, they always poke something out into the audience and everybody goes, oh, no, right? Well, these augmented reality headsets allow you to sit around in your living room and see everything covered by waving seagrass and people walking by and fish swimming in the air in a way that you would just reach out and touch. I know that of my Lutz, John, Colin, and Edward, who are the people I can see, that there's a comment, a, a question or a comment or something in there for people. I'd love to hear some perspectives that you have on how these things might be. So you are welcome to take your microphones off mute at this time. If you'd like to ask a question or as Bridget um, had asked oh. for a comment or any feedback, anyone is welcome. Anyone's welcome. 
And probably someone in here, their son or daughter is a redhead working on one of these things right, <laughs> right now. And don't, and you can't say anything about it. Well, I, I've, I, I've nice. always wondered about um, virtual reality glasses and how come it hasn't taken off a lot more because it's been around for quite some time now and you see very few in the way of products. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad to see that, you know, it's finally coming to be, you know. Yeah. Getting there. <laughs> yeah, two more years, yeah. Right, well, I they know, know that these things you know, virtual reality is kind of fun for entertainment, but they know that nobody is walking around with this, right? And, and when it comes to glasses, the tough part is you still need, you need a lot of battery power. You need some, mm. some physical things, right? That, you know, there's gonna be something up here because there's gotta be lenses and there's gotta be projectors onto the things. And so Apple, one of the reasons Apple's a little bit further ahead is because they have so many iPhones available. If you can have a wire from your glasses to your phone or to a battery pack, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be able to get some of the juice from the phone. And also mm -hmm. it can use some of the, the computer power from the phone. You know, it doesn't have to, because yeah. it's so... And then it somehow has to be less than five thousand dollars, right? Because, um, wait, somebody, somebody, yeah, um, it has to be less than you know five thousand dollars. But can you imagine how incredible this is going to be? And you can play with some of these things on your phones right now. Um, yeah, I think uh, it'd be very useful with Alzheimer's. Um, but I was also wondering, um, a friend of mine, um, friends of mine in Europe, uh, well, I'm concerned at my, my age, I'm concerned about falling. And uh, from what I understand, uh, in Europe, at least, there are a lot more um, able to uh, augment uh, um, like, um, you know, if I, I fall, uh, I have a suit that will blow up around me so I don't fracture my hips or something wow. like that. Um, and I was just wondering what, what you knew or if you knew anything about that. That's cool. Is that in homes or is that just in hospitals? I think that it's uh, available in, in home, yeah. Um, I, I heard about um, I love that. Yeah. I I, no, the um, only thing I know is like like our life alerts or our, um, uh, Apple Watch. Apple Watch yeah, now has yeah. the fall alert stuff. I just think I would I would bump into something and then my pants would blow up and it'd be embarrassing, <laughs> you know, or something. That the fire department would have to come get me out of my pants. <laughs> but what a great thing, right? Um, yeah. Um, also, like the Japanese with their, their robots and you know. That's I'm that surprised thing. we're so far behind the curve. I guess that's what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah, although I don't know that the robots are sort of a, uh, generally adopted too much yet. Uh -huh. And we, we have, Apple is us, right? Apple and, <laughs> Apple and uh, Facebook and Microsoft are US. So we, maybe we're not, we're not um, commercial yet, but MIT and all those, those are us. So I think, you know, none of these things is cheap, right? Just like the first cell phones, right? They were the car phones and stockbrokers had car phones in their cars and they were, you know, ridiculously expensive and huge. And, you know, it took a long time for us to get to the point where there's like these almost throwaway flip phones and throwaway phones, right? So a lot of these things, uh, as you see them come out in two years, you're going to go, $5,000, who in their right mind, you know, <laughs> at some point. Uh, could you, Jerry, should, yeah, Jerry, please, yeah. could you explain um, a little more about how the Apple um, Watch works in terms of, well, in general, but in terms of safety features? Oh, yeah. Um, uh, that's kind of, I have a whole talk on that. So Apple is really leaning into health um, and making their devices wearable health enhancements. So Apple watches 
can now check not all of them. You know, the I think the last three models uh, from maybe the seven. Not sure if the six has these. It can check for atrial fibrillation. It can't check if you've had a heart attack or anything, but it can see if you've got AFib going on. Mm -hmm. It can check your blood oxygen level, like a pulse oximeter. Mm -hmm. um, it can it can tell whether you've fallen. It can tell your uh, the let's see the phone itself. If you keep the phone with you, just the regular phone without the watch, uh, it can say your not just how many steps you've done, but your walking asymmetry. So you may not even notice that you're walking a little bit off balance. And what happens is if you do that over time and it kind of charts the whole thing, um, it, it's you have a hugely increased risk of falling. And I don't have the, I can't share the charts, but my, my very young 29 year old son recently had uh, herniated discs and actually a ruptured disc and had surgery, which is way too young to have that. But he went back and looked at his iPhone and it literally showed he hadn't, you know, he paid no attention at, to it at the time. But you could see his walking asymmetry where it says you're not walking correctly mm -hmm. back from when he just barely noticed that his back hurt and it ramps all the way up to his surgery date. Mm -hmm. And then boom, it goes back to really good, even though he still couldn't walk very well. The, the way that your body moved, it could track that his feet were working at least in relation to each other. So the walking asymmetry, uh, I'm trying to think of off the top of my head, the being able to share oh, your, your cardio fitness level, the watch helps because the watch does your blood oxygen level. So during exercise, it tells you how many calories you're burning and your exercise level. So it tells you your cardio fitness because it knows, it knows what your blood oxygen level is when you are, uh, you know, walking upstairs and things, mm -hmm. measuring your sleep. And I think mm -hmm. the next, the next version of the software that's coming out this fall for the watch is more emphasis, better emphasis on sleep. Uh, I think someday they're working on getting a, a temperature, you know, a basal body temperature in it. Um, it would be amazing if they could do a glucometer, but you can get glucometers and blood pressure cuffs and things that will talk to your phone uh, and some Android phones as well, too. Mm -hmm. And that information could be shared with your doctor, could be shared with your family. I shared with my sons, here's, here's my how much I walk every day. If you notice that I'm not walking at all on a, after a couple of days, give me a call. <laughs> I'm not sure that they will, but those kind of things. So mm -hmm. they're leaning into that health. Great. That's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah, it's what, what is an Apple Watch costing these days? Ah, um, I think on on I think you could get it get the ones with these features. I think for 279 on sale. I think they're usually like 350. So like um, watch seven, and of course they come out with a new one every year. So you don't need to get the latest or greatest, but I think the seven, it's right around $300 now. Mm -hmm. And you need to make sure you have a phone that's at least like a, a 10, mm -hmm. you know, to get it. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna want to be able to focus on understanding all the health features in that. <laughs> Therein lies the challenge, but it's a good challenge. There are resources, yeah. Uh -huh. Thank <clears throat> you. And do you offer tutorials in this sort of thing individually as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's kind of and what I do. All I need to do is contact you with the- um, Yeah, uh, the gardens. Email. Uh -huh. yep. Yeah. Great. Yeah, and, and you'll be getting from the gardens. The gardens will be sending you uh, the slideshow, a copy of the PDF of this slideshow for your personal use, not for organizational use, please. For your personal use, they'll be sending it out and it'll have, if you open it up, there'll be some contact info in it. It'll be coming from the gardens, so watch for the mail mm -hmm. from them. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for good questions. It's cool, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> Bridget, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for 
your time today. Our, our time is actually coming to a close, and it, it's hard to stop thinking about um, you know, knowing that there are so many great questions out there to ask with all the new technology coming forward, but it's so wonderful to have a resource like you to help guide us along the way as new options become available. So as Bridget had mentioned, we will follow up with an email to all of you tomorrow, which will include the, um, the slide deck, as Bridget had mentioned, as well as uh, a edited video of this, in case you would like to show this to others too, maybe other friends that weren't able to participate, and a feedback form too. So please take the time to complete those and send those back to us. Um, Bridget, thank you so much again for your time uh, today. And that concludes thank you. our webinar for today. Thank you all also for attending. And we'll talk to you all again very soon. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.